Welcome to Shout It Out, a glitter band podcast hosted by Warren Paul and Andy Chamberlain. Episode 5, The Star Guitar. Our theme is courtesy of Glenn Greenhood and John Springate. was a long version of our theme, Rock and Roll Queen by Glenn Greenhood and John Springate. Does that guitar sound familiar, Andy? It, it does, yeah. Very close to uh, what we're talking about today. Which is the star guitar. It is, yeah. And here's uh, another example of it. That's the first time I heard the star guitar, and I'm sure the same applies to many others. What about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was um, obviously the first opportunity to hear it, and I heard it, you know, in 1972, um, along with everybody else. And it was, yeah, was it on, up on it straight away. Was it Top of the Pops? Was that the first time? Uh, I suppose Top of the Pops was probably what well, stuck in my memory, but I must have heard it before on radio or something but yeah I'm more vivid to have seen it on top of the pops because it's a visual memory rather than just a auditory one well I heard it the first time the next year which was early 73 73 at okay. would you believe a form party at school um, oh, right. <laughs> and kids got you got to bring in records you know what I mean now at that stage I don't think I had any records, but this kid brought brought in Rock and Roll Part 2, and that and The Other Side were played again and again and again. So I um, thought, yeah. yep, this is pretty good. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously first appearance is the star guitar that, you know, we're talking about wasn't in on, on show then, but once it came in, you know, that sort of reinforced it for all of us, I'm sure. But apart from people like myself, who who had never seen Gary or the Glitter Band, so for us, it was just a piece of music we liked. Yeah. Mm. This podcast could be considered to be a game of two halves, the star guitar sound yeah. and the guitar itself. And they're not necessarily the same, are they, Andy? Um, no, 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 not really. I mean... The sound can be achieved on other guitars is probably all I'll say for the minute because we're going to explore this in a bit more detail. But um, yeah, they're not they're not necessarily the same thing. I mean, maybe we, we should say the slide guitar sound or um, yeah, maybe we should refer it to that. But I guess we will just revert back to what everybody else calls... Which is the star guitar. It, the star guitar sound, yeah. <laughs> on a long tour of Australia in the 80s, Jerry Shepherd ended up going out with a couple of members of the crew to see a band on a rare night off. I think it was in Sydney. Now, I'm not sure whether any other Glitter Band members joined joined them, maybe Tony Leonard, but Jerry ended up being quizzed over the star guitar. At the end of the sound check the next day, the Inquisition continued, and I should add, the Inquisitor, who was a sound mixer, by the way, but he didn't know anything about guitars. So he's gone up to Jerry and said, look, how do you get that sound? So Jerry smiled and pointed to the body and said it's in here. Andy? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the simple answer is it's the tuning. The second part of that is 
for live work, particularly in some recording, it's to do with the electronics as well. But um, the tuning is the primary thing. So <laughs> obviously other people weren't really doing it. So he he was being a bit coy, but it's true, it was in the body of that guitar. And in terms of the tuning, what, what can you be a little more specific about that? Every single ch- string... Instead of a A, A, D, G, B, would have been um, tuned to A. Right. Essentially. So you've got an open A chord um, just by strumming the guitar without, you know, putting any fingers on the frets. Um, Yeah. Sounds simple. Get a simple, you know, sound from it. But it is quite unique the way that the um, phasing goes on between the various versions of the A string and everything and the different thickness of the string. So um, you get something reasonably unique from playing that way with that tuning. And it, it seems that, that well, my my view is that I think that tuning is a bit of a Mike Lander original. Now, we'll discuss later about how it was used on mm. some other records in the early 60s. But but they seem to be, if you like, a separate lineage, don't they? Because we've had a listen to a few tracks from the 60s and listened to the tracks from Mike onwards. And I reckon Mike probably came up with the idea himself. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't put it past some, you know, somebody in New Orleans sitting on their porch not able to play guitar properly and tune them all to that to go, you know, to, to, to sit on their porch and sing or play some blues yeah. in an easy way. I I, I don't know. I, um, as I say, we can come back to that more when we listen to other tracks, but uh, probably... Th- those are the tracks, which, as you said, we'll go into later, but they just, it's used quite differently to how Mike would use it on the Glitter mm. Records, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's true. But as you said, we'll still go into those because it's a, it, it's a it's an interesting part of the story. And we have a comprehensive star guitar story written by Mark Wall in the early 2000s, which features an interview with Jerry Shepherd, and there are contributions by John Rossall, Harvey Ellison and Tony Leonard. I'm sure Mark's a familiar name to many. He did a terrific job running the website for many years. The interview is copyright, so we won't be reproducing it on Facebook. I've tried to contact Mark. I've lost his email address, and I can't find him. I hope it's okay with Mark if we draw on his work for this podcast, but as I said, we won't be putting it up on Facebook. If anyone has a contact for Mark, would you mind sending me a message? And Andy, would you like to tee off? Okay, so quoting this um, uh, article, uh, the first gold sparkle star guitar was made for Mike Leander, as the first Gary Glitter single, well, it's B-side, Rock and Roll Part 2, soared up the charts. He gave the guitar as a surprise to Jerry Shepard moments before a Top of the Pops appearance. John Russell recalled, Jerry's face was the picture when Mike walked in for the first time. Mike opened the case and we all looked in amazement at this bright gold glittering guitar. Needless to say, Jerry thought Mike was having him on about using it properly and there was some persuading to get him to use it. That's the sanitised version. According to JR, Mike pulled him aside and said, quote, if that ungrateful so-and-so isn't happy, you can get yourself another guitarist. Well, at least we know how the story ends. Andy, do you reckon Jerry's concern may have been his peers? Because, when was this, 1972 with Top of the Pops? I'm sure everyone in the music industry would have watched the Top of the Pops. They probably all sat there and bagged it, but they watched it. And before the Bostons, he played in three other bands. So do you think his concern might have been, what are my peers going to think of me standing here with this guitar? Yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, got to get over the having to stand there in glittery costumes and some makeup on your face. True. I guess, and then to suddenly then get a next step of a specific instrument, you know, and if you're a purist and really um, love your guitars and what have you, mm. to, to suddenly be thrust um, with that towards you, it's like, oh my gosh, what is this? <laughs> um, 
you know, I'm a serious musician and, you know, I'm going out with kiddies novelty guitars on stage. So further to this, um, we have a quote from Jerry, uh, which confirmed um, JR's story. And that is, I think Mike was offended at first as he'd gone out of his way to have a guitar made by someone who actually couldn't make guitars. <laughs> it wasn't the right scale length for a guitar. And so I said so. It was silly of me at the time, but I was young and I agreed to use it. Well, I guess um, you'd have a fair idea of um, Jerry's opinion after hearing that, wouldn't you? Yeah. The origins, the origins of the gold guitar remain a mystery. However, Mike Lander's colleague and friend, Eddie Sego, thought that Mike had been built for him by a friend at the BBC Props Department. Mm. And Jerry was never sure where it came from, and he went on to say... When I first plugged it into an amp, it was useless, but nothing that a couple of new Gibson pickups wouldn't cure. Um, mm. Andy, I've zoomed into a photo that's on all the Facebook sites at the moment, and that's showing Jerry on stage in Melbourne. Um, and I, I know he's using a different guitar, but I assume the answer will be the same. What and where are the pickups? Uh, so on a, on a guitar in general, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, Andy, so I'm, I'm got... just assuming that, that people are looking at that photo that we've got in front of us, you know what I mean? Which is a fairly loose shot, but if you, if you can just give us an idea of where the pickups are and what they do. Yeah, so obviously he's right-handed, so he's playing the guitar um, strings with his right hand. Yep. So around the area, you've got some um, uh, uh, pickups that are little little rectangles and they're just magnets with coils of wire around my, uh, wound around them some single some more than that double and what have you so they sit behind the strings do they yeah so unlike um an acoustic guitar which would have a microphone picking up the sound of the strings uh -huh. um these pick up the vibration of the strings interacting with the magnet and um then they can preamp that and then amplify it through an amplifier uh to get the sound that way, and obviously you've got you can, you can EQ it and you can adjust the, the you know the tone and um, which pickup you use. You can use two different pickups to get a different sound, thinner sound, fatter sound. Despite the new pickups, there were still problems with the guitar quickly losing its tuning during performances. Jerry recalled, "Anyone who attended our early shows may recall a roadie nipping on stage and taking it off for retuning about five times during the show." Due to this problem, it was never used in the recording studio by Jerry. He added, particularly, or basically, the guitar was a kind of stage propish thing, so it was always in its case travelling to and from shows, or when recording, we used whatever was available, including hiring guitars from the local music shop. Stage propish. Andy, do you have some more information about the Star Guitar's origins? Yeah, so a couple of um, articles uh lead us to a guy called Chris Eccleshaw and he was based in a London workshop uh, behind the Uxbridge Road, Uxbridge Road near Ealing Common Station. Um, we have a quote from Chris actually from early 1975 and that says, David Bowie has got a 12 string of mine. I did one in the shape of an axe that I believe went to Alice Cooper and I made the star shaped guitar the Gliss Band used on top of the Pops. Mystery solved. And you'd almost think we've rehearsed this, wouldn't you, Andy? Yeah. Did Chris have anything more to say? Yeah, he did. Um, um, so talking about making up what he described as novelty, novelty guitars that he was sometimes asked to do, he said, they're very effective on top of the pops, but I wouldn't like to do too much of that. Those glamour ones are only joke guitars. Ah, so it's clear that the maker, Chris Ecclesall, and Jerry Shepard agree. The guitar wasn't designed to be played live. Jerry was right. Yeah. The gold guitar survived hundreds of gigs, rehearsals and TV appearances over the next few years until the Tuesday night at Tiffany's in Bournemouth in mid-75. Tony Leonard told the story. It was near the end of the show and we'd come on stage for an encore when two fans got on stage and grabbed Jerry. Jerry lost his balance and fell over. And Jerry remembered falling over. I instinctively held the guitar to break my fall. Over I went, and it snapped in two. Mike wasn't impressed, that's not surprising. So to make it up to him, I took the guitar to a good friend of mine and asked him to fix it up, which he did, and it seemed fine when I called to collect it. So I packed it up for our tour of Australia. Uh, 
And I should add, that short tour was tacked on to the end of a longer tour of New Zealand with Gary, the glitter band headline in Australia. How did that repair go? Well, um, as far as the guitars go, not so well. Um, Quoting John Springate, he said, Yes, I remember landing in Australia and waiting at the baggage carousel when I heard one of Jerry's famous Oh Effing Hells. So that was flipping, was it? How do you think? This is words to that effect, yeah. Um, so John added, the huge case that held the guitar was busted and it, there it was, broken in two, again. And Jerry continued, I was a bit annoyed. The repair hadn't been cheap and it hadn't worked either. Plus it meant I needed another guitar, so it was off to buy another Gibson for the short tour. This was now the second guitar destroyed by the baggage handlers in Australia. Thanks, chaps. Is that a photo in front of you, Andy? Yes, it is, yeah. And this photo is also on the Facebook site. Would you care to supply some details? Yeah, so this photo that we're talking about, um, and hopefully people can see by looking at Facebook, it's a photo of Jerry on stage at Melbourne's Festival Hall on Sunday the 6th of July 1975. We think this photo was taken by Loretta Bendoriccio Swan, but we're not sure. If you're listening shortly after this podcast has gone to air... You should easily be able to find the photo on a couple of glitter band as well as Jerry Shepard's Facebook site. There are also some other great photos from this show floating around Facebook. That was the second show of the short tour that Jerry was talking about. They played Sydney's Horden Pavilion a few days before. Andy, is Jerry holding a familiar looking guitar? Uh, yes, and it's not gold, it's the silver one. <laughs> yeah, and because according to what we've just heard, the Gold Star guitar, broken into, arrived at Sydney Airport a few days earlier. The guitar mm. in the photo, as you've pointed out, does look like Star Guitar Mark II, the silver one. So I guess memories are fallible, aren't they? Uh, yeah, yeah. I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Mine look, it, it appears a guitar probably has arrived at an Australian airport broken, but it Obviously wasn't the gold star guitar, but maybe just another guitar. Yeah, maybe. So do you have another explanation for the demise of the original guitar? Yeah, a couple of things that um, uh, is a, a common um, claim that, uh, in fact, I'll go to one of these explanations, which is on the back of a glam compilation um, released in the early 2000s. On that, Jerry talks about the gold guitar being destroyed um, at a Newcastle City Hall gig on the 29th of May, 1975. And I think, obviously, other interviews that I've heard and um, conversations considering that date, that does seem to be more likely, um, you know, because I've heard that, ended up in a skip after that gig and things like that some probably exaggerations but uh that's probably the strong that's maybe that was jury's intention but it didn't happen <laughs> no well it's easy to see how there could be two such different stories the glitter band were doing so much touring and recording during 1975 it must have been a bit of a blur hmm. and i think I've, I've already sort of pointed towards this but did Jerry ever have anything good to say about that gold star guitar? Uh, no, not one bit. <laughs> so really. could he, in the back of his mind, possibly have had a plan? I'm not suggesting anything slightly nefarious, of course. Personally, I think yes. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody maybe put me wrong on this, but I, I think he did. I agree. Um, I, I think... Plans have been put into place already um, for a new guitar. What's interesting is we had we've had a couple of quite vivid recollections that go into quite a bit of a detail in terms of accidents, mm. and they're very very good memories, aren't they? Oh uh, yeah, but yeah. They're, to yeah. they're completely so they're, on they're also completely inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, not 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 necessarily deliberately, but maybe a bit of covering going i don't know um i guess in the end jerry got his replacement guitar didn't he yeah back to mark's story it was decided a replacement would be needed and with the glitter band's hectic schedule in mind 
Jerry called Rob Davis, his friend from Mud, who he'd worked with on the film Never Too Young to Rocks, and also Top of the Pops, where they've done appearances together. Now, on a show like Top of the Pops, you'd spend a tiny amount of time rehearsing and doing the show, but a lot more time sitting around talking, basically doing nothing. So they would have known each other from both those productions. Rob suggested Midlands guitar maker John Birch. At the time, Birch's company had made quite a few guitars for Black Sabbath. They'd made Rob Davis's heart-shaped guitar, as well as Dave Hill from Slade's Super Yop guitar. And John Birch went on to make guitars from many well-known acts, including Brian May of Queen and, would you believe, even Roy Orbison. Andy, do you reckon that Star Guitar is the most famous or well-known of the lot? Maybe the closest could be Dave Hill's Super Yop? Yeah, um, I would say so. I think, you know, um, it's a simple eye-catching design, really, isn't it? You know, five-pointed star. Yep. um, And you've got a unique guitar sound, so it works with that. Yeah. Um, And and like, I guess, Dave Hill's Super Yop, which didn't have a unique guitar sound, did it? Well, it had a strong guitar sound. But, um, but not but a unique tuning. Guitarist. It wasn't the only guitarist on the records and performing live. So um, that really was, you know, a prop yeah. at that time. And it was soon abandoned for use. Whereas, um, you know, once the glitter band stopped in 77, the guitar, which will it come to on in a bit, which made a couple of appearances. But then Jerry started playing it again from 80s early 80s and you know for the next 20 or 30 years uh, and beyond with other people replicating it um it's a survivor it's it's a survivor as as an icon as an icon as a uh representation so i think it probably yeah, is yeah i just i think there's a guitarist from depeche mode used it yeah martin gore's got one yeah let's get back to mark's story Basically, the gold broken guitar was rebuilt and tacked together by John Birch and handed to his partner, John Diggins, as a template for a new one. So John Diggins carefully constructed the new guitar and it was his idea to incorporate the fancy decorative headstock at the top of the guitar neck. Uh, The cost at the time uh, was £400 for this new guitar and the equivalent figure for that today would probably be about £4,300. That is an awful... A lot of money. Off the top of your head, what would a new Gibson SG cost, roundabout? Uh, I think 1200 maybe, 1300 Um Depends which one you buy. There's a few models, but... Um, but roughly in that area. Yeah, I mean, you could probably pick one up for eight or 900 maybe. It depends, really. Um, hang on, give me two, give me two seconds. Yeah, so yeah, so thirteen hundred pounds to eighteen hundred pounds. Um, so that 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 second star guitar cost a lot of money. Yeah, mm. yeah. Harvey recalled going to pick up the guitar at John Birch's office. The new case was huge, and there was no room in his car for the old guitar. <laughs> Jerry came up with a simple but unfortunately inelegant solution. He broke uh, Harvey's quote from Harvey. He broke the gold guitar back in half. That's a classic spinal tap. Put it in a hold oar and slung it in the boot of my car. It stayed there for a few weeks until one of the roadies saw it and stripped all the hardware off it. It's a mystery where the remaining wood and strings ended up. So I guess it's fair to say that um, Jerry was not particularly attached to that original guitar, Andy. No, no. Not when he's got a new one, <laughs> for sure. So it appears that Star Guitar Mark II, uh, the John Birch Silver one, uh, made its TV debut on Top of the Pops, uh, backing Gary on Doing All Right With The Boys, only a couple of weeks after the um, fated Newcastle gig. And that's pretty quick, isn't it? Well, you'd think so. And the guitar man its live debut in New Zealand a week or so later after that Top of the Pops appearance. Mm. Um, I don't think Jerry was ever delighted with the playability of the new guitar. 
But I suppose, Andy, it was a vast improvement on the gold one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, it worked with Gary, uh, Jerry, sorry, not Gary, yeah. um, until the band um, stopped working uh, live around mid-1977, uh, let's say, although that, the split was never official. Um, the guitar actually ended up in a lockup owned by CBS Records, along with the band's other equipment. And a couple of months later, CBS decided to clear out the lockup and sell the gear. They wanted to obviously recoup some of the money they lost on the Paris Match LP. As a fan, I guess that's a story that you don't want to hear. But it seems at the time that sort of action by record companies was not unusual. Yeah, actually, things like that, even if they didn't have the entitlement to do it, they did it, and everybody felt powerless, I guess. The good thing is that um, a former uh, Gliss band roadie, uh, or GG roadie, recognised the case for the guitar um, just in time during this period. And um, although it seems convenient, he swiped it into the back of his own van Classic. and took it over to GG's flat. Um now, I know this is true, that Gigi got it in the idea in his head that he owned the guitar. And I'm going to jump in because the story gets even better. Um, because a, a couple of years earlier, which is mid-75, Gary gave an interview claiming that he paid for the original gold guitar and wasn't sure if he ever got the money back. And <laughs> also, now there's got another one. 20 years later, in the mid-90s, Gary claimed in another interview that he owned the star guitar. And though this time, this would be the silver guitar, right? Though this time, and he was talking about the silver guitar, and he wasn't sure who had it. How good's that? It's even more obvious. Well, he knew it was in Jerry's possession, didn't he? Um, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you reckon that sounds like a marriage? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think he's playing a bit. I mean, I, I'm going to say this now because there was a witness um, to this conversation. I was there with someone and they'll... they'll if pushed, I'm sure, um, back me up on this, that we we were talking about Jerry with Gigi uh -huh. and um, uh -huh. he pretty much said, oh, tell him I want my guitar back or something like that. No, no, but but he was playing, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. um, the thing is, people, interviews and stuff like that and people he met would talk to him about yeah. it and this, he'll add to the whole fable that... Um, you know, it's actually his and stuff. Particularly but. as it's both guitars and he's claimed ownership for both guitars. That's that's the bit that I love, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, this is a wonderful story. Um, would you like to continue? Yeah. Um, so, obviously, this time period that we're talking about, um, Gary was in the middle of his Super uh, Silver Star tour um, and obviously mainly the cabaret stuff and everything. Um the star guitar was used as a prop at the back of the stage and um, he gave it to uh, Ollie Housel, who was Gary's guitarist for this tour, um, uh, to play apparently. Right. Is that right? Well, <laughs> funny you ask that question, Andy. Um, close but no cigar. We have some more information. Ollie Housel wasn't offered the job first. Rather, Gary's then musical director, Lance Dixon, contacted Ollie's uh, friend, Brian Godding. Brian wasn't available and referred Lance on to Ollie, who took on the job. It appears a second guitarist was subsequently employed to accompany Ollie. During rehearsal, so that the second guitarist would have been on the star guitar, you'd think, or the star guitar, to, to get the star guitar. That would sound. be the intention. I'm yeah. assuming, yep. Yeah. During rehearsals, Lance Dixon got back in touch with Brian Godding and mentioned the second guitarist wasn't working out. Brian was now available, liked the idea of working alongside his mate Ollie, and took on the job of playing the second guitar, which just happened to be the star guitar. Is that complicated enough, Andy? It is pretty complex, yeah. yes. Well, so basically <laughs> we've, we've... It's convoluted. Basically, yeah. basically we've, got, we've got a bloke, Brian Godding, who's been offered the job of playing with Gary. So he wasn't able to do the job, so he's given it on to his mate Ollie. Subsequently, it seems like they've decided they needed a second guitar, so they employed mm. a second guitarist. But during rehearsals, the second guitarist hasn't worked out, so therefore the job was offered to Brian Godding, who then played star guitar. Mm. I think I need to put this up on Facebook so it'll make a bit more sense. My apologies, everyone. The question is, how did things work out for Brian Godding 
and the star guitar that he was playing. Well, not so well, uh, unfortunately. No, um, so Brian Godding ended up slinging the guitar, fib, apparently, in a garbage bin after getting <laughs> sacked from the band for falling asleep on stage um, and a variety of other misdemeanours. Um, we're not sure what happened next, but it appears he wasn't replaced and that was when the star guitar ended up as a prop at the back of the stage. I mean, to be fair, it, it wasn't played properly anyway. Um, you didn't really get the, you know, glitter sound um, even when it was used. Not not well. Um, at the end of that tour, Gigi gave it to his son, Paul, who put it under his bed where it remained for a couple of years. And that story about the bin and getting sacked... If you've got that in front of you. That came from Brian Godding himself. So that's a quote mm. from Brian. So, yeah. I think Brian was a jazz guitarist, Andy. Um, Most of them were, yeah. 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 Um, he must have yeah. gone into shop being handed that thing, I guess. Yeah. I mean, if you see the sort of bands at the time, they were a bit different. Then it became a bit more normal, like a five-piece band. But uh, um, at that stage, it was, yeah, you were getting jazz guitarists and all sorts of other musos coming in. Massive band too, considering Gary's financial state at the time. You wonder how... Yeah, I mean, not all the gigs. I don't think they were... I mean, I remember a couple of the cabaret ones being slightly bigger band, but then it quickly reverted. You'd think so. It would have mm. cost a fortune. The money wouldn't have come in, surely. Before Jerry rejoined Gary in early 81, there was another guitarist who you knew quite well. Yeah. What did he think of the star guitar? Well, so this is the inimitable um, Roger Saunders. I mean, you know, people remember him as playing guitar on the um, Live at the Rainbow, was it 1980, um, videotape that was released um, and other gigs and stuff. I was fortunate enough to meet him. Right, great. Oh, very, very funny man. Yeah. Very, very funny man. Likeable. Yeah. Yeah, he was. But you knew him very well. Yeah, yeah. The the star guitar sound uh, and tuning your strings to, you know, one note. Yeah. Well, what, can, what sort of expression can I say that he used? <laughs> uh, um, it, obviously, it didn't happen. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, he just said, you know, come play the... Top couple of strings go up and down and stuff, and but yeah, he just played like a hammer on the strings, get really bang, you know, bang sound on every uh, uh, chord, and uh, that's what you got from Roger. So he had the energy and the drive, personality in the playing and stuff, but uh, yeah, you didn't get the uh, um, slide guitar sound, not from Roger. <laughs> The funny thing is, you know, one thing that we've omitted from this is there's another quote from Brian Godding uh, where he talks about Ollie Halsall and the star guitar. Mm. And Brian Godding says, there is no way Ollie would have gone, A, anywhere near the guitar. No, exactly. And B, anywhere near playing to that tuning. He would have just said yeah. no. So yeah. I guess Absolutely. we now... We, That's what we, I meant earlier. We have two, don't we? Yeah. However, someone who quite liked the star guitar was this person, Jerry Shepherd. And when Jerry returned to playing with Gary in early 81, he asked where the star guitar was. Mike Midgard, Gary's then manager, who had also worked with the Glitter Band in the 70s, had seen it in Gary's son Paul's bedroom. So they went off to investigate. To quote Jerry, The guitar was in the right mess, and at first I thought I'd leave it where it was. The original pickup control knob had been removed and the guitar converted to play left-handed. I managed to find an original pickup to place back on the guitar and a repair and paint job was carried out as the guitar had suffered some damage through the years. I then took it home in readiness for the circus tour and beyond. Shortly after, it was apparently uh, used in the studio to record uh, the Until the Next Time single, um, and during that session, the guitar was spotted by Adam and the Ants guitarist Marco Peroni, who offered cash for it. And apparently Jerry seriously considered the offer, but uh, in the end turned it down. Uh, but he did agree to Marco using it um, in the video for the Apollo 9 single. 
I think Marco also ended up, well, not ended up, I think he wasn't able to buy Jerry's guitar. I think he ended up buying Dave Hill's Super Yob guitar, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's still got it. Okay. Now, the Silver Star guitar had a full refurbishment in 1996 by Ray Cooper, who has performed work for Status Quo, The Kinks, Thin Lizzy and many others. It was continued to be used by Jerry until his retirement in 2002. Do you know where it is, Andy? I I, I do. Yeah. You do? Yeah, I, I know um, it, where it was, and it was re- retrieved from the person, and another fan has got it. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to reveal who that is, but... Uh, Probably not, eh? Well, I'll, maybe I'll find out whether we can, but... Uh, yeah, there is another. Uh, th- thankfully, another fan has got it. So, um, you know, rather than just a some guitar aficionado, it's nice that it's with a fan. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, so, if a fan's got it, uh, I think that's that's that is a very good thing. Yeah. I reckon we've managed to comprehensively cover the guitar's history. I saw the gold guitar when the glitter band played with Gary at Melbourne's Festival Hall in 1974. But amongst the general chaos, it didn't even register. One thing about those shows in the mid-70s in Melbourne, maybe Sydney as well, um, there was so much chaos. I'm sure it was the same in the UK. But um, the other thing was there were sparklers everywhere. You know sparklers? Yeah. Yeah. There were probably every second audience member, which would be over 3,000 people, would have been holding a sparkler at some stage. Very dangerous. I mean, mind mm. you, every second audience just been for smoking as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I sort of didn't really, I didn't notice it. But the silver guitar made a big impression when I was standing in front of Jerry at a concert at Melbourne University in the early 80s. Now, I'd seen it in his predecessor in a couple of video clips on TV, but it had never caught my eye. When did you first see the guitar in person? Well, it's interesting because um, I don't ever recall it sitting at the back of the stage or being used at shows from 77 to sort of 80, 81. Uh, but obviously, once Jerry was back, um, that was the first time I'd seen the guitar. I think the sitting at the back of the stage bit, l- looking at the chronology of, of Brian Godding and that, that tour, I think it was only for a few gigs of that tour. It appears like... Well, yeah, I, I think, I, I think probably so what's true, happened yeah. is after Brian managed to get himself sacked, it probably was put at the back of the stage as a as a stage prop. I mean, it was long till we don't know when he was sacked, but it, it probably wasn't you know a million gigs. Mm. I mean, I, I don't remember seeing it. I mean, there are other people we could ask. Um, you know, the Spangles and stuff we probably remember, um, but I don't remember seeing it. Uh, but yeah, so the first time I saw it. Um, was from the eighties, and that's why I sort of say, um, of all those um, different shaped guitars, you know, that's why um, it's probably for me the standout, unusual shaped guitar, uh, you know, custom makes guitar, and I think you know, so many people have had them rep- um, made as replicas. There's a very good reason why when the um. The first one made its demise that straight away Jerry organised to get a replacement. He knew there had to be a replacement. Yeah. He, he just knew that, didn't he? Yeah, absolutely. 